If you would get a Bible, let's go to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. So for the month of September, the plan is to be in the book of Exodus. We have kissed Matthew goodbye. And the book of Exodus is all about God fulfilling his promise to Abraham. And what is that promise? That all the nations would be blessed by him and through him. Um, so before we rush to Exodus... Uh, just re a reminder here about the second half of the book of Genesis, okay? So it's about Abraham's family. And the book of Exodus is about <clears throat> God's, uh, or rather Abraham's family, turning into the nation of Israel, okay? So big picture, uh, <clears throat> with Genesis 1 through 11, it's about God's relationship to the world. Genesis second half is God's relationship to Abraham and his family, Okay? So now it's not just uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the 12 sons. Now it's a group of 70, okay? And Exodus is all about the family turning into the nation of Israel. And the word Exodus literally means exit. Everybody say exit. How many exit signs are here in the room? Can you, okay? Ex that's what the word literally means. Exodus, exit. Those are the doors in which we what? Go out, Okay. And so God's people are coming and going out of uh, Egypt. So this book is about God's exiting, God's people rather, exiting on a journey. And that journey consists of three places, okay? So you want a high-level view of Exodus? Here it is, beloved. Egypt, wilderness, Mount Sinai. Everybody say Egypt. Those of you a little bit louder online, think Egypt. Okay. I felt like I lost some people. Egypt, Egypt. Wilderness, wilderness, Mount Sinai. That's the book of Exodus at a super, super high level. Three things. Now let's go to the first uh, slide that I, I have prepared for us. We've got three features of the journey to meet God for uh, this morning. So I'm going to try, with God's help, to cover the entire book, okay, at a, higher, at a high, high level. All right? So, as I uh, mentioned, as it relates to the book of Genesis, you had the creation of humanity, the creation of Israel, all right? And then you had God blesses humanity, and then God blesses Abraham. Notice what God says there in verse 1 of 20, Genesis 1, God blessed them, and God said to them. What did he say? Be what? Fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. All right? And then what did he say to Abraham? I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. All right? Now this is important for our understanding of Exodus. Okay? So Exodus is Egypt, wilderness, Sinai, and they represent things as well. They're not just places, they're places of, uh, they're, they're spiritual places as well. For example, do you know where or what God has brought you out of, child of God? He brought us up out of sin, the slavery of sin, right? And are you following God in your journey of life, child of God? Are you following Jesus? How close are you, are you to him? That's the wilderness, the following of God's leadership. And then Mount Sinai is, are you prepared to meet with God? Are you prepared to meet with God? So don't think of these just as, well, that's Egypt, or that's just wilderness, or that's Mount Sinai. This has profound implications for our Christian, our Christian life. <clears throat> So between the creation event and Abraham's call, we had what? Well, we had the three divine and human rebellions. You might recall that. Then you had Abraham's call, Genesis 12, okay? Now get this. This is really simple as it relates to the rest of the Old Testament. Remember, three-fourths of your Bible is the Old Testament, okay? So here it comes real quick. Look, four, four major events. There they are. That's the rest of the New Testament, okay? 
Uh, sorry, I said New Testament, didn't I? That's the rest of the Old Testament. So you have the Exodus stage, the conquest stage, the kingdom stage, then the exile stage. All right? So we're in the book of what? Exodus. So that gives you a, a 30,000 uh, feet view of the book of Exodus. Now, go to Exodus chapter 1, verse 1. Let's dive into the text. Now, these are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob. They came each one with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were what? Seventy in number. But Joseph was already in Egypt. Okay? So that's how the book starts off. I think I have one, yeah, I have one more slide here that I want to show you. So we start in Egypt, and that's slavery. Exodus 12, 41 said, And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Okay? So that's the first half of the book. And then we got the wilderness section. Exodus 19, 1. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. So there's the second stage. And then the third stage is Mount Sinai. Exodus 19, 17. And Moses brought the people out of the camp. Why? To meet God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. So there it is, beloved. If you like to take pictures, do it right there. There's the book of Exodus. Now, how does the rest of the story go? If you're wondering, big Bible picture here. Jesus Christ comes. He's the seed of Abraham. Amen. He's the second Adam. He is dead. He is risen. He is ascended and now seated at the right hand of God. He has sent the Holy Spirit, and he sends out the church on the mission. Praise the Lord. Look, look where we are, beloved, on the timeline. Are we at the beginning of the timeline or at the end of the timeline? I'm glad I don't live during the time of the Exodus. <laughs> right? Look at this. What happens then? Well, Jesus Christ is going to come again in power and glory. And he's going to reign literally on the earth. And all the nations will be under the authority of Jesus Christ. No more Congress. No more deadlock, no more Idi Amin's, no more mullahs, no more Hitler's. Jesus Christ is coming to reign in power and glory. Praise the Lord. All right, now let's get to it. I've got, I've got three features here uh, this morning. The first is God sees his people under bo bondage. Number one, God sees his people under bondage. And I'm, I'm covering with this one truth, chapter 1 through chapter 13, verse 16. Okay? Um, <clears throat> in, we just read Exodus 1, 1 through uh, 4. How many people did you count before it told us uh, the number of 70? Did you count how many people there in verses 1 through 4? If you know the number, shout it out to me. I heard 12. Is 12 correct? Is 12 correct? Yes. <laughs> yes, 12. Okay. 12. So what does this represent, these 12 persons in verses 1 through 4? Well, a new work of God is about to get, uh, begin. It's the number which represents the beginning of the nation of Israel. 12 is, is also the number of government Hmm, that's interesting. How many disciples did Jesus choose? Why did he, do, why did he choose 12? Because of this. The Jewish reader of the Gospels are saying, whoa, who is this, this prophet, this miracle worker? He's choosing 12. You know what's being communicated by the 12? Jesus Christ is saying, I am reconstituting the new Israel. And it does not just include the nation of Israel, but all the nations. And all the Gentiles listening to me said, Amen. Amen. I wasn't expecting the woohoo, but I like it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Somebody's alive up in this church. Amen. 
wow, we get to be a part of this? We get to be a part of this new government that God is creating? You just thought being a Christian meant dying and going to heaven. <laughs> read your Bible. Somebody please read uh, Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We're not just dying and going to heaven in the sweet by and by with the fog machine up to three feet. We're going to rule the nations with King Jesus. I said we're going to rule the nations with King Jesus. <laughs> Do you know who you are, child of God? Pick up with me in verse 5. All the persons who came from the loins of Jacob were 70 in number, but Joseph was already in Egypt. That's interesting. 70 in number. Where have we heard that number before in the Genesis story? Well, if you're reading from left to right, in Genesis 10, the number 70 makes up the uh, number of the nations. You have to count them up. They number 70. In Genesis 11, and according to Deuteronomy 32, it is the number that God divides up the nations according to the number of the sons of God, which are spiritual beings that are over the nations. So Jesus chooses 12 disciples. But guess what Jesus did in Luke chapter 10? He appointed 70 others. And he sent them in pairs of head ahead of him to every city where he was going. That is on purpose. The number 12 disciples is on purpose. The number 70, sending them out in pairs, is on purpose. And if you're reading your Bible from left to right, he's communicating something in the numbers and in the sending. What is he communicating? He's communicating something like this. I'm going to free the nations from the bondage of evil power and do so through my people. Amen. And that is the mission of the church of Jesus Christ. It's called the Great Commission. The Great Commission. Amen, church. This is the mission we are on. It's the mission that he's given us. And this gives purpose to our lives. So, if you're down, depressed, and kind of in a, a pity party, as I have been in times past, and will probably do so in the future, you know the way the whoop, you know the way up out of depression. You know the way up out of the pity party. You know up out of the way of the um, uh, the spiritual navel gazing is. Get on mission with God. Get on mission with God. Stop looking at yourselves and our own circumstances, get your eyes on God, and that God has called us to help free the nations under the bondage of evil. Amen. It's called the Great Commission. Amen. I have a feeling that a lot of Christians are depressed because they're not locking in to the mission God's given them. They're not fulfilling the purpose uh, in which God has called them. Amen. Praise God for what he's doing in this church. Amen. Oh, praise God. We're on mission with God. Amen, church? Look at your bulletin, but not, not now because I'm preaching. Get active. Get involved. Serve King Jesus. Now look at verse 7. Now I'm, I'm trying to hurry. I'm in verse 7. I'm hurrying. Stay with me. I'm hurrying. <laughs> verse 7. But the sons of Israel were what? Fruitful and increased greatly and multiplied and became exceedingly mighty so that the land was filled with them. Did you notice the three verbs? Fruitful, number one. Multiplied, number two. Filled, number three. That's interesting. That's interesting, why? Because of Genesis 1. What happened? God gave Eve, Adam and Eve, their mission after he created them. Do I have a... a Yes, I have it for you. Look, it's on the screen right there. All right? There's the three verbs for you. All right? Those three same verbs are in uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1. God called Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Now we're at the beginning of Exodus, and what's happening? We're seeing the same three verbs from Genesis chapter 1. Do you see the connection here? That's all I'm showing you, the connection of the story. All right, let's go uh, to number, I believe we have number two here. Uh, nope. Uh, 
Number two, God leads his people up out of bondage. God leads his people up out of bondage. And this bondage consists primarily of uh, two intersecting components. You might want to write these down after you got number two down. There's two intersecting components of this bondage. Number one, the bondage under the government of Egypt. And number two, the bondage under the gods of Egypt. Okay? So God sees his people in bondage. Now he's leading the people up out of bondage. He leads his people up out of the bondage. So let's take the first one. Bondage under the government of Egypt. So what happens is a new pharaoh comes to power and he does not view the new, uh, he does not view the people of God as a source of blessing. All right? Uh, if you would like, see verse 8. Look at verse 8 of Exodus 1. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Behold, the people of the sons of Israel are more mighty and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, or else they will multiply, and in the event of war, they will also join themselves to those who hate us and fight against us and depart from the land. So what happened? Verse 11, So they appointed taskmasters over them to afflict them with hard labor. Instead of seeing God's people as a source of blessing for Egypt, this new pharaoh tries to destroy the source of God's blessing. Now, I, <clears throat> I struggle to find an example of bondage that comes from being under a godless government. I really struggle to find that in the history of humanity. <laughs> Don't have to look very far, do you? So, beloved, do you see how relevant God's word is? Right? For example, Black Lives Matter is an organization founded by Marxists. And Marxism is a godless ideology. Does everybody know that? I hope you know that. Marxist, Marxism is a godless ideology. And Black Lives Matter promotes critical race theory, which basically says white people are inherently racist. Now, guess what that statement is? That's racist. And it sows deep division in our country. And I'm calling it out. I'm saying it's a lie. It's poison. It's toxic to our country. And I don't mind if you don't like me highlighting the toxicity and where it's coming from. Amen. I care for the church. I care for the country. So listen to me. It has become the default ideology of the federal government. The idea that America is inherently racist, uh, a racist country, that is a lie. And let me inform you taxpayers about something. The executive branch agencies have spent millions of your tax dollars supposedly, air quotes, training government workers to believe in this divisive anti-American propaganda. Would you like an example? Thank you. For example, Sandia National Laboratories, which, if you don't know, designs nuclear weapons, held a mandatory retreat entitled White Men's Caucus on Eliminating Racism, Sexism, and Homophobia in Organizations. So the diversity training trainers, they weaponized critical race theory to systemically attack the unifying ideals of America. In fact, the training document lists a series of examples of white male culture. Are you ready for this? Here are some examples according to this training document that your tax, uh, your tax dollars uh, promoted. Those examples of white male culture include, quote, golf, Golf? Anybody playing golf? You racists. Quick decisions, self-confident, risk-taking, and brave, and other attributes that the document notes were, quote, generated by participants. Are you serious? This garbage not only runs counter to the fundamental beliefs 
to which our nation has stood since its inception, they also produce division and resentment within the federal workforce. Some of you are in the corporate world, you get some of this type of sensitivity training and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Thank God we have a president that has found out about this and is putting a stop to that kind of garbage being taught by your tax dollars within the federal government. Amen. Now, where, where do you think this false teaching about America comes from? Where does this come from? Who's amping this up? Who's stoking this? Do you think false notions and ideas are limited to within the church? No. No. Here's the second component of what God saw his people in and what he took them out of. Not only the bondage of a godless government under Egypt, but also the bondage under the gods of Egypt. Write it down. Write those two things down. The bondage of the godless government and the bondage of the gods of Egypt. Now, you may not be familiar with how the, U -tes how the Old Testament uses the word gods. If you're familiar with your angelology, according to the Old Testament, the word Elohim which is the Hebrew term for gods, is simply an Old Testament vocabulary term for what we would call uh, angels. And there are some of them that are bad and evil, and there are some of them that are good, right, and holy. The evil spiritual entities, they keep the nations enslaved in sin. And this is where I want to back up to what I had. Um... This is where the, the gods are active in. Sorry, I may have given you some of you whiplash there real quick. All right? So if you're intelligent evil, you're not just going to be, you know, sitting by. You're going you're to want to influence the greater centers of influence in a society or nation. And there they are. There they are. Mark those down. They are experts in evil. They want to maximize their influence. And so they're involved in things like government, business, media, arts and the entertainment, education, family, and religion. They're, export, they're experts in evil. For example, let's, let's take uh, the second to the last one there. Okay? Family. The number of people looking for divorce was 34% higher from March through June of this year compared to last year. Who do you think is stoking divorce, beloved? Evil powers are. Evil powers are. In fact, states along the Bible Belt recorded the highest number of divorce rate during COVID-19 pandemic, including Arkansas and Alabama, the, the, the so-called Bible Belt. Okay. The percentage of Americans reporting depression symptoms has tripled during the coronavirus. Tripled. Used to be about 9% last year. It spiked to 28% this year. Who's stoking that? Who's stoking, stoking that? It's not just a mere psychological issue. You have evil powers that are stoking this among the nations. The U.S. Customs and Border protection officers, they're also noticing an alarming trend in the illegal drug trade. Methamphetamine is flooding across the border at an all-time high, and the coronavirus pandemic has affected its prevalence and its price tag. The drug's gone up because the, the border's getting tighter, and it takes more ingenuity to get the drugs across to the Americans, so the price tag is going up with meth. Beloved, you who are in Jesus Christ, God saw your bondage in sin as well. He saw that you were under the dominion of sin and death. God saw you in the bondage of evil powers and Satan. He saw you dead in your trespasses and sin. But God, being rich in mercy, he caused you to become born again to a living hope. Amen. He took you from Satan. He rescued you from Satan and transferred you out of kingdoms, uh, of the kingdom of Satan into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus Christ. 
Praise God. He saw you in bondage, just like he saw the people in the family of Abraham. And he's leading his people up out of bondage. In chapters 13 to 18, let me get back to the, there we go. In these chapters here, high level now, Moses leads his people out of Egypt. Pharaoh and his army were in hot pursuit. They come to the Red Sea, and the people complain. <laughs> Y'all remember the story? They get to the water's edge, and they're like, have you let us out here to die? It's better that we serve in there. Go back to Egypt. And the Lord has Moses lift his hands, and the waters part, and God's people cross over on dry land. Amen. It wasn't, it wasn't mucky land, right? It was dry land. Now pick up with me in Exodus 14. If you would turn to Exodus 14. Oh, what's that noise I hear? I hear the pages of the Bible turning. Praise God. This, one of the sweetest sounds in the house of God. One of the sweetest sounds wherever God's people are meeting is the turning of the pages of the Bible. Pick up with me in verse 27. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to its normal state at daybreak while the Egyptians were fleeing right into it. Then the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even Pharaoh's entire army that had gone into the sea after them. Not even one of them remained. So God's not a loser. Anytime God fights, guess what? He wins. God has never lost a battle. Verse 29, but the sons of Israel walked on dry land through the midst of the sea, and the waters were like a wall to them on their right and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day from the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people, what? Feared. Something that's lost in the church of America today, the people feared the Lord. We should fear the Lord because of the great exodus that he purchased for us on the cross. And they believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. Well, guess what happens after that? What happens after that? You Bible thumpers. They sing a song. They sing a song. Next chapter, the song of Moses. In fact, it's the first song in the Bible. So guess what that means? That means the very concept of singing comes from warfare. Did you know that? It comes from the victory God gives to his people. This is why we sing. Whatever battery battle you are facing, beloved, remember, listen, remember, the battle belongs to the Lord. Whatever battle you're facing, the Lord has split a sea so his people can be delivered. Whatever battle you're, you're facing, the battle belongs to the Lord. And he's not a loser. Amen. You need to sing to the Lord. This is how we fight our battles. Sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Number three, God covenants with his people. This is chapters 19 to 40. 40% 40 of Exodus is dedicated to this truth. Did you know that? 40% of Exodus is dedicated to what I'm summarizing in chapters 19 to 40, which is what God covenants with his people. In total, there are four Old Testament uh, covenants creating a new partnership into which God can eventually invite all humankind. Okay, there's four. 
Unfortunately, Israel eventually breaks these covenants with God. Now, why does God covenant with his people? There are at least three reasons why. So God covenants with his people, chapters 19 to 40. Why does he do that? Well, I, I see at least three reasons as we look at these chapters 19 to 40. The first is God covenants with his people so they will belong to him. This is beautiful. Pick up with me in chapter 19. You still have your Bibles open? Turn to Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 1. Verse 1 of Exodus 19. In the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. <clears throat> When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Amen. Let me just stop right there. The reason why we are in Jesus Christ is because God has brought us to himself through his son. Amen. He brought you to him. Verse 5, now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my commandment, then you shall be my own possession. There it is. You shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. So do you see that? In verse 5, God covenants, covenants with his people so that they will belong to him. Beloved, hear me. If you are in Jesus Christ, you are God's treasured possession. That's who you are. You are God's treasured possession. Everybody say, in Christ, I am God's treasured possession. In Christ, I am God's treasured possession. Come on, those of you with me online. In Christ, I am God's treasured possession. And all God's people said. I find that in my life, I forget that sometimes. How about you? I forget my identity. I forget who I am because of the many voices that call. And Jesus knows this. That's why he set up a table and said, do this in remembrance of me. But there's a second reason why God covenants with his people. The first is so that they will belong to him. Secondly, God covenants with his people so that they will represent him to the nations. Now, do you remember what God promised Abraham? That in you, all the nations will be blessed. And why is that? Because of Jesus Christ, who is the seed of Abraham, right? So now continue with me in verse 6 of Exodus, verse, uh, Exodus 19. Let's go to verse 6. So he says, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine, verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So here I'm saying in verse 6, not only does God covenant with his people so that they will belong to him as a treasured possession, but oh no, it's not just so we can like feel good about ourselves because we're God's treasured possession. Oh no, we've been given a mission. Verse 6, there it is. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests. Israel was to reflect God's character and the mission of God to the nations, and they failed. Israel had specific people that were set apart to be ordained priests, but the promise here was that all of God's people would serve in some priestly ways. Sacrificial love and prayer. Amen. Amen. And in this sense, there is absolutely no distinction between a pastor and a member of a church. Amen. 
Pastor Mark, in this sense, is in no way special to anybody in this church, nor is Pastor John or any other pastor. Amen. You see? And this sense of clergy has really strangled the church. Everybody in Jesus Christ, we've been made ministers of reconciliation, and we've been given a mission to get this great gospel out. Now, part of this covenant here, so that they would represent God to the nations, includes the Ten Commandments. So let's do a little bit, of, let's do some Ten Commandment boogie woogie here in Exodus 20, verse 1. Thank you for laughing. Okay? Those of you who don't know the joke, we had VBS and we had a uh, Ten Commandment song called the Ten Commandment <laughs> boogie woogie. So let's do that boogie woogie right now in Exodus chapter 20, okay? Who said Baptist churches are dull and boring? Well, I did. Most of them are. Amen. Okay, verse 20. Exodus 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Usually we drive by that verse. We should go to the Ten Commandments. Now, notice, God says, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. I'm the one that saved you. You shall have no other gods before me. That's number one. That's number one. You shall have no other what? Gods before me. And if these gods did not literally exist, that commandment would be irrational. They're spiritual beings. Number two, or rather verse four. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what it is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them. For I, uh, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the fourth and uh, third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing loving kindness to thousands to those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, which is not a reference to cussing, Okay? It's not a reference to cussing. For the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. Here's what that commandment means. You bear God's image. You are God's, uh, you are to reflect God's glory in the earth. You're to be God's best PR person. Amen. And when we live in a way that denies that, God's glory and God's character, that's what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. Verse 8. Remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Um, jump down to 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord gives you. Are there any, are there any children uh, online or in, or in the room? If you're a child, say amen. If you're a little one, say amen. Okay. All right, listen up. Children, do you want to live a good long life? Do you, children, do you want to live a good long life? Online, you listening? Obey your parents. Don't disobey your parents, okay? And all the children said, amen. amen. Or maybe not. Amen. <laughs> amen. Yeah, there, here comes the, the elbows of the parents. <laughs> amen. Okay. Uh, verse 13, you shall not murder. The Bible says God's command does not say you shall not kill. Okay? It doesn't say that. You shall not murder. There are times and circumstances in which the killing of another is good and right. You guys understand that? You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or his Porsche. Oh, sorry. Uh, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Somehow the message version got stuck in there. My, my apologies. So jump down to verse 18. All the people perceived the thunder and the lightning flashes and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood at a distance. They said to Moses, speak to us yourself and we will listen, but let not God speak to us or we will die. <laughs> oh, yeah. God has descended upon the top of the mountain. And what is God's immediate presence like? It's like lightning and thunder. That's what God's immediate presence is like. 
Sometimes we pray for revival. Oh, God, would you show up? Would you manifest your presence? Would you show up and manifest your presence? Do we really want that? Like lightning and thunder. Now, to help us visualize this, there's this gift that I showed you last Sunday. Remember this? This is from Noah. Uh, these are lightning strikes within the Hurricane Laura. Look at that. Remember I used... Uh, what was it, Job 38, 35, where God asked Job, can you say forth to the lightnings uh, that they come to you and say, here we are, right? So I thought it'd be good to show you this because that's what God's presence is like, the lightning. But I got another video clip here that I'd like to show you. Now what you're about to see is this lightning bolt that splits that middle tree from top to bottom, okay? And then, and then I also added a slow-mo video of it as well. That's some power, right? I had to strip the audio because there was some language from the people that viewed this. Look at that. Look at that. That is power. Their poor porch. Look what happens here when the top of the tree falls on top here. What's the insurance phone number, honey? Look at this. The presence of God is on the top of Mount Sinai with flashing of light and thunder. Do you not think that this is happening all over the top of the mountain? This is why the people are in freak out mode saying, uh, Moses, you going up for us. You talk to us. We're going to die. The power of the presence of of God. Amen. Amen. Now, there's this other thing I wanted to show you as it relates to the Ten Commandments. Okay, stay with me now. How many commandments? <clears throat> Thank you. Why? Why Ten Commandments? Because of Genesis 1. Because of Genesis 1. Reading your Bible from left to right. Why? There were ten words spoken by God when he created all things. Did you know this? And here it is visually. Can y'all see it? Yeah, it doesn't look too bad. I've highlighted for you visually the number of time God, um, uh, God speaks or the, the term God says in the very first page of your Hebrew Bible. And so what, God, what is God communicating to his people here with the Ten Commandments? Okay? With ten words, God creates his universe into being. And with these Ten Commandments, God is speaking the nation of Israel into uh, existence. So with creation, God spoke, but through rebellion and disobedience of Adam and Eve, access to God's presence was lost, right? Remember Genesis 3.24? God drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So why are you, why are you bringing this up, Pastor Mark? Here's, here's the takeaway. With these ten words from God from the top of Mount Sinai, God is recreating, if you would, his people through covenant so that they would be like him. It's as if he's resetting the relationship Indeed, the partnership with his people through covenant so that they would be like him, so that they would represent him, uh, uh, him, yes, to the nations, to the nations. So God covenants with his people so that they would do these things. Now, after the chapters that cover uh, the law, the Lord moves on to give instruction regarding the tabernacle, Okay? So this is what's happening, big picture, in chapters 19 to 40. You've got the, the giving of the Ten Commandments and the, more, uh, the additional commands that follow to help uh, uh, the obedience to God's people. And then after that material, the Lord shifts, and he moves to give instruction regarding the tabernacle. Now, remember, the tabernacle is where God's immediate presence is recovered as it relates to meeting with his people. It was lost in the garden. 
And if you would recall, in Genesis, God's immediate presence came to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you all recall this? Right? God's immediate presence came to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And what did they do in response? Hey, this is kind of cool. Thanks for coming down. Talk to you later. They built an altar. Right? And they worshiped. That was in response to God's immediate presence coming to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They built an altar. It, the, those altars are many prototypes of the tabernacle and ultimately prototypes of the temple that would come. Why? Why? So God is restoring his immediate presence with his people. Amen. This is so good. Man, I love the Bible. Look at, look at Exodus uh, 25. This is so precious. Exodus chapter 25. I'm touching third base and I'm about to uh, try to go for home plate here. Stay with me. So I'm using Exodus 25, 1 through 9 as the third reason why God covenants with his people. The first was what? Why does God covenant with his people? So that we would be his treasured possession. We would belong to him. Secondly, why? So that we would represent him to the nations. Here's the third reason why God uh, covenants with his people. And that is so that they will meet God. So that they will see God. Pick up with me in verse 1 of Exodus 25. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the sons of Israel to raise a contribution from, for me. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall raise my contribution. <clears throat> this is the contribution which you are to raise from them. Gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet material, fine linen, goat hair. Amen. Everybody say goat hair. I bet you that's not one of your Bible memorization verses. <laughs> Verse 5, ram's skins dyed red, porpoise skins, acacia wood, oil for lighting, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrant incense, onyx stones and setting stones for the ephod and for the breast uh, piece. Let them construct a sanctuary for me. Why? That I may dwell among them. There it is. There it is. That I may dwell among them according to all that I'm going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture just so you shall construct it. Yes, there it is. Why the covenant? So that his people will meet God, be with God. This is why chapters 25 to 40 exist in your Bible. Remember this when you get bogged down in the details of goat hair, fine linen, and onyx stones. Amen. This is where we check out and say, uh, out of here. Chapters 25 to 40. This is why they, they exist. God is restoring what was lost in Eden and what was lost in Eden. What was it? The manifest immediate access to the presence of God. We lost it because of our sin. Now, let's go forward to the end of the book. Chapter 40. Chapter 40 of Exodus. If you would, pick up with me in verse uh, 34. It's the last section there of the book of Exodus. So they follow God's instruction, and look what happens. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord, what? Filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from, the, from over the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out until the day when it was taken up. 
For throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day, and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. The immediate presence of God, the manifest presence of God. This is what Jesus Christ has purchased for us immediate access to the very throne room of God. And now we don't have to fear God. We now call him Father. The manifest glory of God. Before Jesus Christ came, what did he do? He sent the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came in fire. Remember the cloven tongues? It's the manifest glory of the Lord. And now the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the tabernacle of God is no longer in a mobile tent. It's no longer in a, uh, um, a temple or a, a church, a building constructed with four walls. No, no. Now we are the temple in Jesus Christ. You, church, are the temple of the presence of the Lord in Jesus Christ. Amen. And he has not left us alone. He's given us the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. My heart goes out to people who are trying to navigate 20, the year 2020 and the COVID crisis without Jesus Christ. Can you imagine? Without Jesus Christ? I understand why. There's turmoil and stress and the increase of depression and suicide, and drug abuse. People are without Jesus Christ. And God's given us a mission to proclaim the good news in the midst of this mess, church. Amen. And God has strategically, every one, every, every one of you, God has strategically placed so that you would bear witness of Jesus Christ. May the Lord give you strength and wisdom to do that this week. Amen. As we navigate these troubled waters. But remember this, beloved. Remember what the Lord took you out of. He took you out of the bondage of both not just sin, but spiritual power, powers, dark powers. He set you free from them, and he's leading, he's leading us now. Are you, are, you, are you close to his heels? He's leading us now. And as I close, I ask you this. Are you prepared to meet God? The only safe place for that encounter is in Jesus Christ. Is in Jesus Christ. Are you prepared to meet God? Let's pray together.